This is Real Estate Rookie Show 370. Now, over the last year, you've probably heard about traditional short-term rental investing and this funny phrase called short-term rental arbitrage. Both these strategies are better known as traditional Airbnb investing or Airbnb arbitrage. And arbitrage is where you're renting a property from another property owner and you make the difference between the rent charged and the income brought in. Guys, I'm Tony. Today, I'm rocking my first solo episode, and I want to welcome you to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, Three times a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. Now, Ricky, there are pros and cons to every investing strategy, but it's better to know what those are ahead of time before putting your hard-earned money to work, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, I'm speaking with the Ricky investor who has done both of these strategies, right, the arbitrage and the traditional ownership, and we're going to hear what he would have done differently if he were to start all over again in 2024. Kiron, brother, welcome to the show, man. Super excited to dive in with you today, man. Great. Thanks for having me, Tony. So uh, we actually go back a little bit, right? I I met you at one of our events uh, back in 2022, and I I think at that time you were just getting started, brother, so it feels like a a really full circle moment here to to have this conversation with you. So I'm I'm really excited to to hear how things have been for you. Now, give the... Give the folks a little bit of background, man. Like, um, what inspired you to really jump into real estate investing? I know your your parents kind of played a role in that. So, just what was the big motivation for you to make this whole thing happen? I started my real estate journey technically back in 2015, but I didn't really start ramping it up until 2020 uh, when COVID hit. So, I started with the traditional house hacking uh, back in 2015. Bought a two family house, live in one unit, rent the other unit long term, and that's kind of where my real estate journey started and ended. And then 2020 rolled around and, you know, something happened that clicked in me and I was like, I need to really, really hop on this real estate thing. So I started deep diving into podcasts, this being being the first one. And uh, I listened to you when you were a guest and then when you became a host, which was which was amazing. So listening to you talk about short-term rentals, that kind of put the idea in my head of, hmm, what is he talking about? Short-term rentals, like I hear Airbnb, if I stayed in Airbnbs before, but I never thought about hosting on Airbnb. So when I heard you moving away from the long-term rental strategy into the short-term rental, that's what what made me really deep dive into that. I love that, man. And now, Kiran, you had a an, you know a very stable daytime job, right? That you know people retire from that after decades and decades. So, what what did you do for your day job? And and I guess what was that moment to make you say, I, I really need to jump into this full time? So, I'm currently still a law enforcement officer. I've been a police officer for t- the last twelve years, and. It's it's been it's been amazing. Uh, it afforded me the opportunities to 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 dive into real estate, and you know I needed an extra source of income on top of my nine to five because I'm raising a family and I knew that I needed to do something else. So that's when I I dove into the real estate game. Now I, I just wanted to find some terms for folks that are listening. I mentioned them briefly in the intro here, but um, there are a few different ways you can go about investing. In Airbnbs, there's the traditional strategy where you own the property, right? You go out there, you get some kind of mortgage, you pay cash, whatever it is, but your name is on the deed, on the title for that property, you have ownership. Um, and then you obviously go and rent it out on, on Airbnb or Verbo. The other strategy, which is incredibly popular, is called Airbnb arbitrage, where instead of you going out and uh, purchasing a property, putting your name on the title, you're renting a property from another landlord. And instead of moving into that property yourself, you turn around and sublease that on Airbnb. Pros and cons to each, right? With ownership, you get uh, appreciation, you get the tax benefits and you get cash flow. Uh, pros to arbitrage are you get cash flow, right? That's the biggest thing for arbitrage. So the, the goal of today's show is to, to kind of drill down and, and see which strategy might work best depending on your situation. So Kiran, for you, um, where did you get started? Did you start with arbitrage? Did you start with ownership? And I guess what has rental arbitrage really done for you, done for your business, done for your personal life? So I actually started uh, with the ownership piece. Um, like I mentioned back in 2015, I, I house hacked my property. I'm actually still living in that same property. So after six years of having great tenants, they were moving out. And at this point, this is when I was introduced to the short-term rental strategy. So I said, let me turn this unit that 
that I'm living, you know, next to into a short term rental and see how that does. So, you know, fast forward two months to set it up. Um, it became a, a phenomenal, phenomenal short term rental. It's over 90 percent occupied every single month. And it's it's been cash flowing crazy. It's been cash flowing crazy. Uh, Long term rents were fourteen hundred bucks. And then. Now I'm averaging anywhere from three thousand to five thousand a month. Fourteen hundred to almost three thousand per month. That's like almost or more than double, right? If you had three k, and I think that's the 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 power of of short term rentals as a strategy. Um, what is like what is your because you're house hacking this? So what do the expenses look like? Like are you are you fully covering your mortgage? Like is there cash flow on top of that? Just give us a quick numbers on the house hack. Yeah, so it's actually fully covering my mortgage and expenses. So yeah, he electricity and water and it's providing some money in my pocket at the end of the day so i'm getting paid to live in my own house which is insane one of the biggest expenses for people aside from taxes is their living expense and i think a lot of people when they when they look at especially house hacking they feel like they've got to make a ton of money on the cash flow side but even if you're just able to break even now you've just reduced one of your biggest expenses of your living down to effectively zero, which then frees up all this additional capital to then go pour into maybe that next real estate investment. So it sounds like you absolutely crush it with this uh, this house hack. And we'll, so just really quickly, Kiran, what, what market is that? What, what market is the house hack in? We're in uh, Stratford, Connecticut. So Fairfield County, just about an hour north of uh, New York. Okay, I'm I'm from California. I've never heard of Stratford, Connecticut in my life. But it goes (laughs) to show that short-term rentals can be uh, effective in many, many markets across the country. And that's part of the reason why I have a beef with the whole uh, Airbnb bust uh, concept. It is true that there are some markets that have been more impacted than others. Um, our properties in Joshua Tree, we've seen revenues get squeezed in that market for sure. Our properties in Tennessee, you wouldn't even think that there is a difference, right? Like everything looks the same out there. So it is very market dependent. Um, so I, I'm just happy to hear that you're not in some big vacation hotspot. You're in Stratford, Connecticut, which is an hour north of the next biggest city, right? And it still works well for you. Yeah, it's crazy because when I first started, people were like, oh, who's going to come to Connecticut for Airbnb and yada, yada, yada. And I pretty much, you know, shut those people down with the numbers that that I've posted. I, I want to get into the transition to arbitrage, but one last question on the ownership piece: um, What are like what is drawing people into your city? Are you noticing that it's it's like folks who are visiting family? Do you have a lot of traveling professionals? Like, what is it that makes Stratford, Connecticut, a, a healthy market for short term? So for me, what the three th- three major things that I looked for before I started in this market was uh, major hospitals major colleges and universities, and we're on the shoreline, so I'm five minutes away from the beach. So those three things alone drive the the guests to our property. But I narrowed it down to 18 reasons why people have visited my properties. I've literally went through messages and narrowed down 18 reasons why people have come to Connecticut. And I'm like, this is crazy. So, so you've, you've got something that's pulling people in, which is an important part of choosing your market correctly. Now, let's talk about the transition to arbitrage. And before you even talk about why you made that transition, I just want to know what has that change in strategy afforded you when it comes to your lifestyle and, and just kind of how things have shifted for you since you made that decision? I retired my wife from her nine to five job. Um, It was a great way to learn uh, the systems and the processes uh, for my business, and it created cash flow for me. You're saying it like real calm, cool, and collected, Kiran, but that's a that's a big deal, man. You you retired your wife from this decision to focus on on this new strategy. So I think for a lot of people that are listening, the goal is to you know allow their spouse to maybe stay home with their growing family. Their their goal is to eventually become job optional for themselves. And and it seems like you've taken that first step, which is incredibly impressive, Kiran. So how did you do it? Like like what what pulled you into arbitrage? And then what has your process been for kind of scaling it up? So what made me go into the arbitrage route was the barrier to entry with the rental arbitrage. And it was a new strategy that 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 I stumbled upon and, and wanted to try my hand at. So the barrier to entry was, you know, the low cost it takes than the traditional buy and hold route. So I tried my hand at it and it it, it was great. You know, the, the, the barrier to entry for me for my properties were anywhere from ten thousand to to fifteen thousand. And having those low costs 
still with the cash flow was a was a win win for myself and you know and and everyone involved. One of the big pros it sounds like then for arbitrage is that the capital needed to get started is is lower than purchasing a property in most scenarios. So you said you're you're able to set one of these units up for ten to fifteen thousand dollars as your total investment. Yes. Wow. And and what does that ten to fifteen thousand typically cover? Like what are the what are the costs associated with standing up an arbitrage unit? They normally require a security deposit and first month's rent. And then that also includes furnishing the property. So adding the mic, uh, adding the toasters, the, the coffee maker, the, the, the furniture and everything that you need to, to run a functional uh, short term rental property. So one of the things that people always look at um, when it comes to a traditional like owning a property for short term or any other type of investment is their cash on cash return or how long will it take for me to get my capital back? So uh, a 100 percent cash on cash return means that however much money I invested, I get back in that first year. A 50 percent cash on cash return means it would take me a year and six months. So what is the typical time frame that you've seen to recoup that initial investment of 10 to, to $15,000? Is it a year? Is it two years? Is it three years? What does it typically look like? It's roughly anywhere from six months to a year. No way. Yes. So, and I think this is one of the the powers of of this strategy is that you're able to to start recycling that capital relatively quickly. Because say you go out and you drop you know 10k, six months later you got that 10k back, redeploy that to another property, six months later you get that back, and now you've got two units that are giving off cash flow, so you got more to dump into that third property, and that snowball effect starts to move a little bit faster. How many arbitrage units do you currently have up and running? Four. And as you've set those units up. What was your process for identifying the right city for arbitrage and then identifying the right um, the right unit, like the right property itself? Uh, it was pretty much just where it's located, location, 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 uh, you know, as, as it said in real estate. Um, so hospitals, major colleges and universities and beaches are, are the biggest three biggest uh areas of where I want my rental arbitrage units to be. So once I identify that area, as long as the rents make sense and I know that whatever I'm going to be cash flowing will cover the expenses and then still leave some money left behind, I know this, that's going to be the great area. So are you investing in your own backyard, Kiran, or have you kind of ventured outside of uh, Connecticut? I'm still in my own backyard. I'm still in Connecticut, but I'm looking to eventually branch out now that I uh, created my systems or processes. I mean, it's good that you have been able to scale in your own backyard because your your market can support that type of demand, which I think is is really great. Um, so what are some of the other benefits, some of the other pros associated with going the arbitrage route? Obviously, it's significantly less capital. Uh, your, your your payback period is, is faster. What are some of the other benefits you've seen that come along with investing uh, in the arbitrage model? Another pro is uh, not being liable for the property maintenance, which is huge. You don't have, you know, if a furnace goes out, you're not coming out of pocket, you know, a few grand to, to fix that. You know, that's going to be on the landlord, on the, on the property owner. So that's a that's a great pro pro for you, because I've had that happen in, in one of my properties that I own. And it, it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun. So we, we launched a few arbitrage units, our, our first arbitrage units late last year. And um, this last month, the uh, the HVAC unit went out of one of our units. And same thing, instead of us having to coordinate that, we called up the owner, said, hey, uh, our next turn is on this day, this time, please make sure you send someone. And someone was there to, to get it to get it fixed for. So the the property maintenance piece definitely, uh, at least that expense comes down, down a little bit. Now, we do have uh, a uh, an understanding with our landlord that some of those minor expenses we're just going to fix ourselves. Like if there's a a clog in the drain, we'll we'll just fix it ourselves with our handyman. If there's a you know a I don't know a, a fixture that goes out, we'll just have our handyman fix that. So are you doing any repairs yourself, or are you pushing everything to the actual property owner? Just the major things, uh, like you said, the low ticket items, I take care of myself. I don't want to you know bother the landlord with with that minute stuff. Or anything that my guest might have potentially damaged, we'll we'll cover that cost, no problem. But as far as the big ticket things that that are out of our control, no, sorry. And I think we'll. I want to at some point get into how you negotiated uh, securing these units because I think that's a big part that folks overlook is sourcing, but also convincing these landlords to accept you as someone who's going to do arbitrage. But 
one of those selling points is what we just said, is that we're going to be the type of tenant that's not going to bother you for all those little things, because I have a guest checking in in four hours. I got to make sure it's fixed before they before they check in. So I'm not even going to go to you for that. So you'll only hear from you if it's something that's big. So I think it's also a selling point for uh, for the landlords there. Big selling point. The reduced cost for property maintenance is something that, that's uh, a benefit for arbitrage. What are the things you are seeing that that are a benefit or a pro to the arbitrage model? Minimal ongoing expenses. Uh, it allow you to build your systems and your processes. So that's that's huge, you know, especially for something that you don't own. You know, you don't have to worry about coming out of pocket for major expenses for a down payment and then trying to run a business that you have no business running or that you have no idea about. And then it don't work. And now you have to worry about going and selling the house. At least with a rental arbitrage unit, if it doesn't work for you or you can simply step away, give the 30, 60 day notice to the landlord if it's not working and you wouldn't have to worry about any other major uh, expenses that you can occur. Super, like so much truth to that. And it, it, like basically your, your exit strategy is a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier. Um, like I've told folks that I'll only open up a short term rental in a metro uh, market or suburban market, if I can say one of two things are true, either one, that property also works as a long-term rental, or two, I'm doing arbitrage because say that regulations shift in that market and now short-term rentals are no longer legal or whatever it may be. Now I've only got to worry about breaking a lease and not trying to potentially sell a property at a loss. So there, there's some some benefit there to, to the ex exit strategy. Um, you talked about being able to build the systems and processes, Kiran. What, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. So with building that up means pretty much automating your business and helping it flow a lot better and easier for you. That way, you know, you're not running around after every guest and, and having a headache. So that means having your, your cleaners in place, uh, building your automated messaging system for, for your guests so you don't have to worry about sending them each guest a message every day and then forgetting to send them the code to the door, having your electronic locks um, and, and and things of that nature. So setting your your auto, your automatic pricing, your dynamic pricing tools. So you don't have to worry about, you know, missing a date that, you know, you should have went up on on the rates, but you forgot. And now, you, you know, you're shortchanging yourself. So. That, that's what I mean by building those processes and uh, systems. And are you self-managing these units yourself, Kiran, or do you have like a, a, a virtual assistant or a property manager? How are you, are you self-managing that piece? Self-managing it every day. Just ballpark, like a weekly basis, how much time would you say actually goes into managing the current portfolio? I would probably say maybe three to four hours a week. Three to four hours. It's it's so it's so easy when you when you automate it and, and build your systems. It's so easy. You retired your wife on three to four hours a week. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing, man. I, I love to hear, it, brother. And now she takes care of the kids, and she's like, ah, it's great, but ah, they drive me crazy. That, that that's how it goes, man. So, Kieran, one of the other benefits that I think that comes along with rental arbitrage is that. It, it kind of allows you to move into new markets a little bit easier. We, we talked about the flip side of that, where you can get out of a, a unit easier, but the inverse of that is true as well, where say you want to maybe test out a market and instead of buying a property there first, you can just set up an arbitrage unit for a fraction of the cost potentially and validate whether or not that market works for you. So I asked a question earlier, like, have you explored in any other markets? You said, I'm still in my backyard right now, but I'm looking to expand. When you go into that new new market, are you going to focus on ownership? You're going to focus on arbitrage, and I guess what's the kind of process you have laid out to to validate whether or not it makes sense? So arbitrage would be would be a great method to try in a new market to to test it out and see if that's a market that we can move into. So if I can set up an arbitrage unit and it can give me a hundred percent plus cash on cash return within that first year that that'll be a definitely a market that I would love to go into and, and potentially buy later on. I want to get in. We talked about all the, the benefits of rental arbitrage, but there, there are some limitations to the strategy as well. So it's not all, all butterflies and rainbows here. Um, but before we get to that, I, I just want to ask one final question about the acquisition side. What is your process for actually analyzing a potential deal to know if it's going to be profitable or not from an arbitrage perspective? For an arbitrage perspective, I use I use their DNA. I use Rabu just to check the market out. Um, the bedrooms and, and bathrooms, I look at those uh, listings on Airbnb 
and try to match them up. And then I look for those hosts in that area and see what they're doing, see what their average nightly and daily rate is and see how much they're charging per night. And then I can see what other amenities and what they're providing and their setup. And I can calculate it all from there to see if it's going to be profitable. All right, Kiran. So I think you just convinced everyone listening to this episode that they need to jump into into arbitrage. Um, but again, th- there's there's some benefits to each strategy. But um, just like all the other types of real estate investing, there there may be some potential cons for arbitrage as well. So from your perspective, what have you seen as some of the downsides of the strategy? So one of the downsides I've seen from the strategy is the rates, the the monthly rates on uh, what you're paying the landlord. You know, every year you get a percentage increase in in the rent. So, you you know, you being an Airbnb host, you're no stranger to that, just like a regular long-term rental uh, uh, occupant. So you get hit with those rates and it could definitely cut cut into your business for sure. I have a friend who really focuses on arbitrage here in California as well. I don't know. He has like a hundred arbitrage units, something crazy like that. And um, he said he had to let some units go where he had almost an entire floor uh, in a complex rented out. And when the owner saw how much revenue he was actually making from the arbitrage, he unreasonably tried to increase his rent. And instead of, you know, accepting that rent increase, he just walked away from like, I don't know, it was like 12 units in one building. So the landlord definitely does have a little bit more control per se. But what I've seen some folks do who focus on arbitrage is that they'll sign longer leases. So they'll they'll enter into a lease agreement. Instead of it being one year, they'll do three years to really lock in that that low rate. So that way they've got a little bit of buffer against um, you know, the, the owner not getting greedy, but you know, maybe trying to capitalize on, on what you have going on. So what's your normal lease length for the four units you have? I do the traditional yearly uh lease, more so because you know, locking yourself into that two or three year rate could also be, you know, a downside because now if that rental unit is not working at all as a short term rental, then you're lot you're kind of locked into that, into that, that rate and into that, that unit. So it, it might be a little harder to walk away. And then you're right. I think that works well if maybe you already uh, have executed at least one lease, right? So if, say you're, you're looking to re-up Instead of reing up for another year, maybe you push for like that that three to five year lease and, and see how that works. What we what we did for our first uh, three arbitrage units, it was one building, uh, same landlord. We got three units, and we actually did not n- almost like a profit share, but um, what we set up was we had a base rent of one thousand dollars for each of the three units we set up, and then the landlords get the first one hundred percent of the profit up to, I don't know, like $1,400 per month. So they'll, they'll get a thousand guaranteed, but say that we didn't perform that month, then they don't get anything above that. And if we get anything above that 1400, then we get to keep that for ourselves. So that's how we kind of hedged our bets because it was our first time doing arbitrage. It was in a market that we didn't really know. Um, and we didn't want to set ourselves up for these big, you know, expensive leases when maybe they, they weren't going to work out. And it, and it did work in our favor because it took us a little bit longer to get those units set up. Um, we had a handyman that we had found and God just like ghosted us, <laughs> even kept some of our stuff. So it took us a little bit of time to get those up and running. And, and luckily we didn't have to pay the full rent. We were just paying that thousand bucks per month. So um, there are some things you can do in the negotiation side to try and work on that, that rate piece. Thousand dollars. I need that. <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know, but your your beachfront, right? So your your units are probably a little bit different than ours. Yeah, yeah. So rates potentially changing is one uh, one con of the arbitrage model. What else have you seen as a potential downside, Kiran, of of the arbitrage piece? Uh, another downside is if the owner decides to sell, and then the new owner comes in and they don't like the model, they could pretty much disrupt your whole business. They could say, "Nope, I don't want any short term rentals." Or, like you said, like with your friend, they want to charge you more. Or do it themselves, and then you know your 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 business, you know your your, your units are, are are gone. Yeah, and I think like the bigger theme there is just like b- between those first two cons you you mentioned, it's just there's a there's a lack of control that comes along with arbitrage, where yes, you get the the cash flow for very little investment, but you also lose an incredible amount of control over how that property operates. 
um, the three units that we set up, the landlords actually text me and said, hey, you know, we're, we're probably going to end up selling uh, this unit or th this, this complex. And it's a 12 unit. Um, you know, we have three of them. And there's, they're like, hey, if you want it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the first offer. But I'm just not I'm not quite sold on that city yet. I don't know if we really want to go into it. So now, like you said, they could potentially sell to another landlord that maybe isn't as amicable to this profit share setup that we have. And when we renew the lease, they want to charge us an arm and a leg. So it, it, there definitely are some downsides to, to not having that ownership there. Well, any other things that kind of come to mind for you, Kiran, in terms of downsides of the, ar uh, of the arbitrage model? Uh, so kind of to piggyback off the pro where you're not liable for the large ticket items at that same token. Now you're at the mercy of the landlord when it comes to those items. So when if a hot water heater goes out and the landlord is like, oh, I need, to, I want to, I'm going to send my guy, but it's going to take three days. Well, the guest is only here for three days. So you mean to tell me they're not going to be able to take a shower? Right. And I've had that happen to me before on New Year's, New Year's Day. So it it was definitely not fun. It was definitely not fun, and and that can lead to to bad reviews because. You know, they don't have hot water. And how did you manage that? Did you did you just give the guests a refund? Did you pay out of pocket to get the hot water fixed? Like, how do you how do you manage that when the owner's timeline for fixing doesn't necessarily line with yours and the guests? Listen, one thing about me is we're going to get it done. <laughs> it's New Year's Eve. I've probably called 20, 20 plumbers. And one guy said, yes, he'll come in the morning, right and early. So he was able to get there and he didn't charge me an arm and a leg either, which was fantastic. But the great part of that was the landlord, he, he picked up that bill because I was able to get that fi fixed. So one of my other concerns with the, the landlord as well is that the ones that maybe want to be too involved, um, you know, where maybe they want to see your listing and they want to, you know, check in on the property. Like, have you had any experiences like that where maybe the, the landlords are maybe overstepping boundaries a little bit? No, no, I haven't actually. Um, they love the units. They're like, oh, my they use my unit as kind of like the model unit for any potential other long-term uh, tenants that are coming in. Like, oh, look how this is staged. And, you know, they'll show them pictures. You're the selling point for them, right? Yeah, so another another con is having landlords show up unannounced. Um, in one of my arbitrage properties, I had a landlord just show up, walk in the property, and I have guests texting like, uh, there's this strange man walking around the property. And I'm like, oh, no. So I looked at the cameras, and it was the owner. So I messaged him. I'm like, hey, you know, we have guests in the house and they saw that strange man outside. And he's like, oh, no, that was just me checking out the property. It looks fantastic. And I'm like, OK, well, you know, just let me know next time so I can warn guests that, you know, somebody's going to be, you know, walking the property or, or just checking it out. So that's another that's another kind that, that may happen. And some guests, they don't care about it. Some do. So, yeah, absolutely, man. So one of the other big things that I see, Karan, and I'm, I'm curious what your take is on this. And I guess before we even get into this right there, what I've seen is there are four motivations that really drive people to invest in the Airbnb space. Specifically, you've got cash flow, appreciation, tax benefits, and then like vacation, like you can subsidize the cost of your vacation spots, right? Uh, but cash flow, appreciation, tax benefits, and vacations. When I think about arbitrage, I feel like the only box you can really, really check is that first one for cash flow. I mean, so I guess, how do you feel about those other three of like the lack of appreciation, the lack of, lack of tax benefits? Like, is that a con to you or is it not as important because you're not as focused on those ones right now? It can be a con if you're, you know, you want to build on those three other pillars, but if you're just strictly in it for cash flow, then a rent and low barrier to entry arbitrage can be the route route for you, you know, because, you know, you're only furnishing, getting in between 10 and 15 and every year, you know, you're making 30, 40, 50,000 on, on that rental unit. So, you know, cash flow, if that's what you're into cash flow, that can be a great strategy for you, the arbitrage route. And that's why I tell a lot of people, like, before you even buy a property, you just need to get clarity on why are you investing in the first place? Like, what are your investment goals? If you're someone who's, I don't know, maybe you're, you're 55 and you've got a few years to retirement and you've got zero retirement savings in place. Maybe you're not as focused on appreciation at that point because you need cash flow today to help supplement your retirement that's, you know, five to seven years down the line. But say that you're... 23. 
you just graduated from college, you're a software engineer for some tech company, and you love what you do, and you don't plan to retire until you get to retirement age, you've got three decades to uh, kind of start building that pot. So maybe you don't need the cash flow today, and you can buy and focus more so on the tax benefits and the appreciation. So for all of our rookies that are listening, you've got to really identify what your goals are, and if your goal is just to get as much cash flow as quickly as possible, then arbitrage might be the route, best route for you. But if you also want to balance the cash flow with the goal of long-term appreciation and the tax benefits, um, then, then you you know you've you've got to weigh those weigh those against uh, the, the the pros there. Now, one of the big questions I have, and I'm sure a lot of folks here have as well, is how are you sourcing these properties? And what does the conversation look like between you and the landlord to get them to say yes? Because I can imagine, Kiran, there's, unless they've done this before, there's probably a lot of hesitation from these landlords to just hand you the keys, knowing that you're going to have, you know, 12, 13, 14, maybe 15 different sets of guests going through their property on a weekly basis. So how are you sourcing and what does the negotiation process look like? So I'm sourcing it through my network. Network is huge. Networking in your local RIAs and, and local meetups is, is very huge. So that's how I'm sourcing these landlords. And one of the landlords, he's a huge apartment building guy. He comes to me with the deals now. I approached him about one property. He actually had a, a little uh, pain with, with one of his rental units. And then I came to him with the short term rental arbitrage. So I solved his headache and he solved my problem of of getting a unit. So then he's seen what I've done with that unit and he loves it and he knows that I'm going to take care of it at, at all costs. So now he's throwing, you know, I got five here. I got eight here. And I'm just like, all right, well, 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 give me give me those three. Give me those three there. I'll take those. Hey, give me a little bit of time. right? Yeah, exactly. So that, that's how I'm sourcing those. So just walk me through. Say I'm starting from zero, Kiran. I've got no network. I've got no relationships. I don't know landlords that are building a bunch of units. If I'm a complete rookie, what steps should I be taking to find that first unit? The steps that you should be taking is is, is doing your research, doing your homework, seeing what units are out there for rent and seeing how long they're on those those uh, sites as far as days on, on market. That can be a way for you to get into with those landlords. You approach them with, with your pitch and with your ideas and you lay out all the pros for for them as a landlord. Most might say no, but all you need is that one yes. So when you get that one yes, now you have a reference. And that's and that's what I did. You have a reference now for other potential landlords. And now you have this 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 track, this track, uh uh this track paper trail. And, and it's track of, of what you've done with with your units. So that that's how I would get started. Kiran, I, I want to get into how rookies can, can kind of mitigate their risk as they get into the short term rental space, because I've, I've heard stories of, of other investors and we'll, we'll get into this in a bit where maybe they over leverage themselves or they, or they move too fast. And guys, we actually have a, an episode coming up next week with a guest named Nicole Rutherford, and she's going to talk about almost an Airbnb horror story where she over leveraged herself on the Airbnb arbitrage side and ended up with almost this mountain of debt that she had to climb out of. So Kiran, when you think about trying to mitigate risk as you set up an Airbnb arbitrage business, what comes to mind for you? Mitigating risk, uh, like just not moving too fast, making sure that that unit that you're, that you're using and that you're, that you're setting up is going to cash flow enough for you to pay off not just your expenses but your debts and then once you get a grasp on that then you can kind of do the snowball effect and get another one do the same thing with that one and then you could keep going like that if you have a large amount of capital and you could just throw it at anything then then yeah but i would take it slow and and do the little snowball effect to to mitigate that risk and how how much do you think your systems have played like your systems and processes you've built out have played in, in like the reduction of risk for you? Would you say it's a big part or, or are there other things that are driving it maybe more so? Oh, it's definitely a big part. Definitely a big part. You know, having those systems in place, you're able to uh, answer guests inquiry a lot faster and capture those guests within that short time frame. Because without having those systems in place, you might have a guest inquire on a property and 
if you're out doing whatever, it might take you three, four hours to respond to a guest. They might have moved on to the other property. So having those systems in place and answering guest questions uh, to capture that lead is, is definitely instrumental in, in your profits and uh, your uh, average uh, nightly rates and, and occupancy rates. So, Kiran, we talked about a lot, but before we move on, I just want to understand, like, I know when I do traditional ownership, uh, one of the things we focus on is reserves, right? We usually want somewhere between at the low end, three months of our mortgage payment set aside on the high end, somewhere in that six to 12 month range. How do reserves uh, play into your business of rental arbitrage? Yeah, so reserves is def- are definitely huge when, when doing the rental arbitrage business, because God forbid something happens in your place doesn't book up for a month or two then you know you're that that's going to be a, a bad for your business so what i try to do is up front i try to front uh one or two months of those reserves and then the cash flow from the property being rented out i build that up to another 3 to 6 months of reserves that way if i don't have any bookings for a couple months i know i'm going to be covered on that end so that's that's how I handle that. And I think the reserves give you that that peace of mind, right? To make sure that if things do hit the fan, if there is some kind of crazy thing that happens like COVID, you're not in the cold with four arbitrage units that you have to worry about. And there's and there's other ways as well, as far as like insurance policies, additional insurance policies that can cover rental loss. Tell, tell me about that, Kiran. Yeah, so I have uh, additional um, insurance. Uh, you had actually had them on the show, proper insurance. Yeah, so I have that on my rental properties. So if something were to happen, uh, you know, fire or just just a natural disaster, anything that would prevent me from having bookings or can or cancel my bookings, I will be covered with that rental loss from that insurance policy. Yeah, so it's it's a great way that that's relatively low cost to kind of give you some additional peace of mind that if things do hit the fi- fan, you can still kind of rest easy at night, knowing that you, you got a little bit of a backup there. Now, before we go, uh, again, we had a rookie uh, post in the Facebook group, and I, I just want to hear your advice, Kiran. And again, this is Nicole Rutherford. She's actually going to be on an episode that will be releasing next week, so make sure you jump in to see the, the whole story here. But here's what Nicole says. She says, hey, rookies, I'm in desperate need of help here. I'm doing rental arbitrage for the last year, and I'm making somewhere between $1,500 to $2,000 per house, but that was only for the first six to eight months or so. Since then, with the increase of supply in our market, we're now losing money. And then landlords are trying to increase the rent even more, even though they aren't asking for market rates. So this is one of those risks we talked about where the the owners maybe get a little bit greedy and want to gouge the the rates there. We still have significant debt from each home because we use the profits to open even more. What should we do? Option one, my partner just wants to sell everything off and move on. We'll still owe about 80K uh, between everything we put into the homes. Option two, find a three to four unit home and use an FHA loan to rent out the other units. If it's in a decent area, we can move the furniture there to convert to an Airbnb or just use a long-term rental. And option three is use the furniture from our four houses for a staging company and then just pay down as much debt as possible. So, Kiran, I, I want to hear, what's your advice to Nicole, given that situation? What would you do? If I were in their situation, I would probably go with uh, finding a three to four unit home and using an FHA loan and possibly house hacking, because that's how I got started. So house hacking and using those other units to produce that income that can help them uh, chip away at their debt. And it covers their living expenses on top of that. So I think that's the route that I would take. Yeah, you're you're the poster boy for that, right? You just crushed it with uh, with your own version of that. That that was a set of that was a lay of it. <laughs> I definitely like that option as well. Um, I think the other option too that Nicole could potentially explore is just because you know obviously this is going to depend on the on the lease and what it looks like. But if the landlords are trying to increase rents, it, it sounds like you might be at the end of those leases. Just look at exploring moving into a different property. <laughs> like, can you find a different property, a different landlord that maybe is willing to offer you more favorable terms? And it seems like she's got homes, single family homes that are, I think she said three bed, two, two to three baths. Maybe instead of doing three beds, can you just take those and move into like one bedroom apartment units? And now you've got three one bedroom apartment units that you can uh, leverage as well. So I think there are some other options there as well in the code, Nicole, to make it a little bit easier for you. But 
We're going to find out what Nicole actually ended up doing in next week's episodes. Let's make sure we get back to that. Now, uh, we heard this strategy of rental arbitrage, Airbnb arbitrage. Kiran allowed you to retire your wife while working as a police officer. So it, it's something I, I just want to drill down on a little bit before we let Ricky's go, because I'm sure they're all wondering the same question. What kind of cash flow are you actually generating from your arbitrage units on a, you know, call it like a, an annual or monthly basis, however you want to break it up? Uh, so last year we finished with our six properties that we have between the arbitrage and our, our uh, traditional buy and hold. We finished just around 300000 gross. And then net is usually about 40, just below 50%, so around 40%. So that was about 140000 net. Which is in in a matter of eighteen months we started these properties, so you know I can't complain. Absolutely crushing it, man, dude! Absolutely crushing it, brother. So again, you've just inspired every single person on this call to go out there and build their own uh, arbitrage business. But just to recap some of the amazing things you shared with us today, Kiran, uh, we learned about how rookies can jump in with this lower barrier of entry. Uh, arbitrage model. Uh, you talked about the importance of building systems and how that's allowed you to scale, but also kind of letting you build this thing up with a little bit of training wheels and, and a little bit lower risk. And then obviously the, the possibility to partner with a great landlord in your market to make it a win-win situation for both of you. So Kiran, I uh, appreciate you coming on today, brother. I'm sure folks got a tremendous amount of um, value from this story. I'm so glad that I was lucky enough to interview you after all, you know, it's been what, almost three years now since we first met and yes, seeing the growth is absolutely amazing, brother. So uh, if folks want to get in touch with you guys, go to the show notes for this episode. We'll put Kiran's information in the show notes there. If you guys want to get in touch with me, my social handles will be down there as well. But guys, that is it for today. I am Tony J. Robinson, your host for today's Real Estate Rookie Podcast, and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Stay